Disclaimer. I have a feeling this could be a long one. So get comfortable. If you have plans this afternoon, cancel them. <laughs> All right, there it's, it's out there. It's out in the open. Fair warning. So you don't have to look at your watch throughout the whole service or give me dirty looks in the lobby later. All right. We're picking up here in Hebrews chapter 6 at verse 4. And the author is giving a warning, a warning about apostasy. And he's just finished talking about how spiritual immaturity is dangerous. How the person who claims to believe in Jesus and to belong to him by faith but doesn't grow is in a vulnerable position. They're, they're in danger of drifting away. And as you remember, he says in uh, chapter 6, verse 1, let's move on. Let's move on from these elementary doctrines. Let's move on uh, from milk to meat. We've got to graduate the basics. We don't get rid of the basics. We don't replace the basics. We've got a firm foundation, he says, but we have to be able to build on it. Now, here's what he says next in verse 3. And this we will do if God permits. So he puts a little pin in that. He dog ears that corner. He's going to come back to that and begin fleshing that out a little bit. But before he does, he's really stressing the importance of finishing faithfully. And that's the title of the sermon this morning, Finishing Faithfully. And you'll see the way he urges him them on in that is that he warns them of the danger of apostasy, the danger of falling away. And he gives them the reassurance they need in order to grow, to stay encouraged, to stay the course. And he encourages them to remember and to believe the promises of God. So with that, let's read Hebrews chapter 6 beginning at verse 4 through the rest of the chapter. Now hear the words of the one true and living God. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises." For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for your word. It is more precious to us than gold, sweeter also than honey, even the drippings of the honeycomb. God, we thank you that your word endures. It stands up to the test of time. It stands up to scrutiny. We thank you that we can rely on it because it is your word. God, I pray that as I preach this morning, you would allow for all of us to, to hear and as my brother prayed earlier, that we would not just be hearers, but doers. God, help us to receive your word this morning with 
faith and with humility and with great confidence that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Truth be told, this is one of the most difficult passages, this first part. One of the most difficult passages in, in Scripture, in, in the New Testament. Um, another one that comes to mind is when Jesus says that there will be those who come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not in your name cast out demons? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That's so alarming, isn't it? And this is saying something similar. Verses 4 through 8 describes a person who looks like a believer, but falls away. Looks so much like a believer, in fact, it seems to almost suggest that someone can be saved and then lose their salvation. It's impossible for someone who has been enlightened, it says, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then falls away to be restored to repentance. You almost get this picture of someone walking out an exit door, and on the outside, there's no latch, there's no handle, right? And so there's no way back in. Once they're out, they're out, and there's no way back in. And this is an important thing for us to unwrap and tease out here. We, we, we've done it some already in previous sermons, but we're doing it here again. He says, if you do fall away, there's no hope for you. It's a tough pill to swallow, but that's what he says. If you do fall away, there's no, there's no way back in. The door's been shut. But here's something I want to make sure we really understand about this passage and that warning, okay? Anyone who does that doesn't want back in. This isn't someone who wanders off for a while, like a prodigal son, and then returns uh, with a contrite heart and repentance and is restored. For the apostate, there's nothing for them to be restored back to. Remember, a good companion verse here is 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they, were not, they, they did not belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have continued with us, he says. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Okay, so what you have then is someone who seemed to be saved but turned out not to be. They eventually reveal who they really are by their rejection of Christ. They do that either by trashing the whole thing, right? Just walking away and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with any of that anymore. Or they embrace doctrines that are foreign to Christ's teaching. They embrace a form of Christianity that is not Christianity. That could be wandering off into a polytheistic cult like Mormonism, for example, or one that denies uh, the, the divinity of Jesus or the Trinity like Jehovah's Witnesses. There could even be uh, Roman Catholicism. And y'all, I know, sometimes we're tempted to believe that Roman Catholicism is just another Christian denomination, but it's not. That's, that's a different gospel. That's, that's a different authority. And when they were called out on it during the Reformation, there was an opportunity there for repentance, for restoration, but they chose rejection. It's just fact of the matter. So whether you abandon the name of Christ altogether, what we're talking about with apostasy here, sometimes it looks like just walking away, turn your back on it, just going off into atheism, okay? That's one way. Another way is to latch onto these doctrines that are foreign to Christ, that are strange to the gospel, and running with those. That too is a, a rejection, a turning away. And there's a more severe judgment for them, he says. Why? Because they came as close to God as one can possibly get in this life, and they rejected it. Got as close as you can and rejected it. These aren't people who played around the edges. They were in it. They were a part of the visible church. And they shared in all the blessings that come with that. And we'll talk about some of those blessings and what they are. But what, first, why is the author saying all this? Why these warnings? Why is he laying it on so thick here? And the answer is because he wants them to finish faithfully. He wants them to finish faithfully. He warns them not to fall away, and he encourages them to persevere. So if we split this up under two headings this morning, that's what it would look like. Okay, warnings from God and reassurance from God. This whole passage is all about falling away and persevering. Falling away is how you can know someone isn't a Christian, that they weren't a Christian. Persevering is how you can tell someone is 
a Christian. So let's unpack this warning from God. He says it's impossible for someone who walks out on Christ after receiving all these spiritual privileges to be restored. It's not just that they don't believe, okay? They've participated in and benefited from seeing so much light, receiving the blessings that God showers on his covenant people. This goes to show us, as we saw back in chapters 2 and 3, that someone can be a part of God's people and have no part in him. There are people in the church who attend Bible studies, who serve in the church, who, who partake of the Lord's Supper together, who, who sit under the teaching and preaching of God's word regularly. They're on the inside. They, they are identified as God's people, not some other people, right? They're God's people, but they have no part in him. They're a part of the visible church, but not the invisible church. The, that, that which is made up of only those for whom Christ died and applies the benefits of redemption and reconciles sinners to God through the blood of his cross. And Paul talks about this in Romans 9. He says, not all Israel is Israel. Does that sound familiar? We heard that before. Not all Israel is Israel. What he means is not everyone born Jewish is a child of Abraham. It's not the children of the flesh, he says there, but the children of the promise that are counted as offspring of Abraham, those joined to God by faith. So this has always been true. This has always been true. Belonging to God's people, belonging to the covenant community, being a part of his chosen nation, but not being saved. That's always been a thing. The Israelites he talked about in chapter 3 in this very book of Hebrews hardened their hearts and were cut off from God's people but they were part of God's people externally, weren't they? They they were delivered out of Egypt right alongside everyone else, but they never made it to the promised land. And why does God say they never made it in? Unbelief. They didn't make it in because of unbelief. And that's chapter three, verse 19, if you wanted to go back and look at it. They were a part of the right crowd. They were a part of the right crowd. They saw the same things. They saw miracles and wonders of God, participated in the same uh, spiritual practices, followed the same rules, were under the same law and authority, but they never entered in because of unbelief. That's a category I want you to keep in mind here as we look at this passage, because he's still kind of riffing on that. I I know that's been several weeks ago for us, you know, preaching through the book of Hebrews. For him, it was just, you know, a few breaths ago as, as, he's, as he's speaking, okay? So I want us to keep that in mind. That it's the same thing he's describing here, still riffing on that. Think about the number of spiritual privileges the Israelites enjoyed and things that they saw and experienced for themselves and yet did not believe. How about the 10 plagues? I mean, that, kind of, that would knock your socks off, wouldn't it? See some of that stuff happen. They saw all that. They were there for that. How about parting the Red Sea? God parting the Red Sea right in front of them, them walking through on dry ground. How about manna, food from heaven, just resting on the ground like dew every morning for sustenance? Water from a rock. Now, what we learn from that, y'all, is this, is this is important too. It's important even as you, as you talk with, with unbelievers and you're sharing your faith and, and giving a reasoned defense for the hope that is within you, as we're called to do. It's an important thing to keep in mind. You can pile up all the evidence in the world and someone still won't believe because it's not about being convinced. It's about being born again. Trusting God, following Him, that's belief. That's faith. So it's possible to see and experience all those things, to soak up all those privileges, to come that close and still not believe. And here's the thing, the judgment of God for that person is greater because of the amount of evidence given to them and the blessings of God that they did taste, that they did experience, but chose to walk away from. But we read this, and this, this person sounds like the real deal, don't they? 
here in this passage in Hebrews, the, the way this person is described sounds like a true believer. And, and of course it does. That's, that's the point of the whole passage. An apostate is not someone who didn't look like a Christian. It's someone who looks just like one and turned out not to be. Verse 4 says, they are those who have been enlightened. They see the truth of God's word. They accept it on face value. They say, that sounds all right. I don't disagree. I'll go along with that. They are those who tasted the heavenly gift, it says next. They received real blessings that God showers on his covenant people. And commentators have a lot of theories uh, uh, about this, what he means there, the heavenly gift. What, what I think is probably most likely, that it seems to make the most sense here, is it's talking about the Lord's Supper, right? Partaking of that heavenly meal of the Lord's Supper. They are those who participated in this means of grace that God gives especially to his covenant people in the church. And the next thing he says there is, these are those who have shared in the Holy Spirit and powers of the age to come. And that's where we go, what? How how's that work? I mean, that definitely sounds like a true believer. And again, that's the point. This is someone who had a lot of interaction with the things of God, but is not one with him by faith. Remember what I said earlier about the other warning passage in the New Testament that scares us, that makes our hair stand up on end? In Matthew 7, Jesus says, you know, uh, there'll be those who come to him and they're like, didn't we do all this stuff, Jesus? In your name, didn't we do it? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. So our minds really need to be open to the fact that someone really can be blessed by God, used by God, and not one with God. That's a thing. It's a category. Saul was that way, wasn't he? King Saul, first king of Israel. Chosen by God, used by God, abandoned God. How about Judas? Judas was along for the ride, wasn't he? You know, it's not like you, you know, he's hanging out with uh, uh, Peter and John and the gang and they're all doing miracles and he's just like, it's not working, you know? It's not as though, you know, at the Last Supper, Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And then all of a sudden, he looks over, looks over at Judas, and there he is, like, wringing his hands, sweating, armpits all spicy. They wanted to know when he said that, is it me, Lord? That's what he said. Is it I? They were all wondering, could he be talking about them? It wasn't obvious. That's the point. So, yes, of course, the person who falls away looks just like a real Christian but they're not. Verse six says it's impossible to restore them again. This is the hard part, right? Because it raises a lot of questions. One of those is like, can an apostate come back again? And the answer is not if God has given them over to their sin. It's like that exit door that I mentioned earlier. The apostate has hardened their heart and walked out Because they've hardened their heart, they don't even want back in. So now listen, this is something for us to kind of sift through and wade through here. There's always hope for someone who wanders off. Have you ever lost your way for a little bit? Drifted away for a season? a day, a week, a month, a year, longer even. That might not be true for all of you, but I I believe it's probably true for a lot of you. It's true of me. You know, if you lived a season of your life where despite what you knew, despite what you had seen and heard and even believed, you kind of lived with one foot in, one foot out. And by the grace of God, and the power of his spirit working in you, he jerks you back and snaps you out of it. And you recognize the spiritual danger that you were in. And you repent. Glory to God, you come back. The point is this, apostates don't come back. They don't want to come back. They have rejected Jesus despite having tasted some of the benefits his people enjoy. And the judgment is more severe 
because they've received the message loud and clear repeatedly. They participated in the things of God in the most intimate way that you possibly can in this life, and they said no. Stand by the ways and see, and ask for the ancient path where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. And they said, we will not walk in it. Jeremiah 6, 16-ish. Verses 7 through 8, the author uses this analogy of rain falling on the land and drinking it up. That's what, he's, that, that, that's what this is like, he says. Like land that drinks up the rain. All of that blessing, all of that goodness. And what we would expect as a result is a crop. For all that water, there should be fruit. But if the land soaks up all that water and instead produces thistles, that land is worthless and its end is to be burned. So before we move on past the warnings of God and onto the reassurance of God, consider again the question that we asked last week. If true believers, if it's true that true believers cannot lose their salvation, why does the author issue these warnings at all? Because who can know? Who can know, right? We can't know who the apostate is until it's too late. So God is kind enough to give us the warnings so that we'll be urged to finish faithfully. And if we say, well, that's not for me, I, I, I know I'm a Christian, I'm a true Christian. You know, I, I, I prayed the prayer. I walked the aisle. I've been baptized three, four times. I, I, I've grown up in this church my whole life. I'm an elder, I'm a deacon. We have to be careful because the reality is the apostate probably thought the same thing at one point. You know, I hear about these Christians, some of whom have had large followings, platforms, followings, blogs, uh, podcasts, whatever else. And then you hear about them, they, they deconstruct their Christianity. Have you heard of this? It's, one day they wise up and realize all of that Christianity stuff was wrong. I was wrong about that. And what's interesting, I've never heard any one of them say, I wasn't a Christian after all. I've never heard one of them say that. that would, that's the truth. That would be the truth of it. I, I was never a Christian after all. What they say instead, though, almost all of the time is, I was a Christian and now I'm not. So it's not impossible for someone to think there's something they're not. In fact, that's exactly what this passage proves. So remember, these warnings are not for non-Christians. They're given to everyone in the church who says they're a Christian and believes they're a Christian. That's who the warning is for, and so the warning is for all of us. Now, important point here. Come back to me, because I know the warning's heavy. I... I can't make it lighter for you. <laughs> it's heavy. It's supposed to feel heavy. But I know that you can be tempted to like crawl up under a rock somewhere and just hide. Don't do that. All right? Come back to me for a minute. He doesn't leave us there. As scary as these warnings are and as seriously as we should take them, and we should take them seriously, and we should consider how severe he says the judgment is. But know this, that doesn't mean you can't have assurance of your salvation. You can. You absolutely can. You don't have to lay awake at, awake at night thinking, what if I die tonight? Am I saved? I hope I'm saved. God doesn't want you to live that way. He does not want you to live that way. He wants you to be reassured. But part of the way that you'll be reassured is that you persevere, that you do continue. All right, so let's start looking at that here. Let's look at reassurance from God. Here's what the author begins to do. He doesn't just warn them, he reassures them. Why? Because he wants to see them finish faithfully. So looking at verses 9 through 11, the author cools off a little bit here kind of eases off the gas some, and he's optimistic, you know? He says, I don't think this is you, by the way. He's expressed his concern. He's worried that they, they, 
that they haven't matured. They should be farther along than they are. He's, he's made that point very clear. He says they should be farther along, but he sees fruit here. And he says there's hope for them. He sees their good work, their love for his name, and that they are serving the saints, verse 10. That's fruit he can see. They appear to love God and love God's people. That's a good sign. That's a great sign. We've talked about how you can know if someone is an apostate already. You don't know until it's too late. They're out the door. And then you know. But this is how you can know if someone's a Christian. Do they bear fruit? Is there, is there fruit there? If there's no fruit, it doesn't mean the rain hasn't been falling. It has. So it should be bearing fruit. And God allows us to see our own fruit sometimes, to encourage us, to reassure us that he's got us and he's at work in us. He lets us see it. So let me, let me help you all with something if you struggle with this, okay? Because sometimes I think we can uh, think that observing fruit in our own lives is prideful. It doesn't have to be. You know, don't, don't do that. Don't shy away from that, okay? Don't brag about it. But you ought to be able to recognize it, and that should assure you of God's work in your life. Have you ever felt like, man, I, 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 I can just see God using me lately, and it's so humbling, but so satisfying. I can feel God's pleasure. I see him working in my life and I love it. I'm not perfect. I'm not sinless. I've got a lot of growing up to do. I should be more mature than I am. But God is faithful and he is causing me to bear fruit in my life and I can see it and I praise him for it. I want more of it. And that's what the author wants them to want, to want to see it, to want more of it, to persevere like that to the end. In verse 11 through 12, he says, I want to see you stay in course. I want to see you have that assurance and that hope to the end. So be serious about your faith and your interest in the things of God. Take it seriously, he says. You know, I, people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just not really that religious, I go to church and I try to read my Bible. I'm just not that religious. I've heard Christians say that. That's scary. Take it seriously, he says. Don't be sluggish, verse 12. Have an earnestness to have full assurance so that you won't be lazy about these things. Press on, persevere. Be imitators, he says, of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And be patient, he says. It's a marathon, not a sprint, right? I don't know about you, but that's hard for me. See David nod, and we've had the conversation before. It ain't easy. I don't like marathons. So let me get there and be done with it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Just be patient and just finish. That's what he's trying to say here. Keep going. Who cares if you're the last one across the finish line? Just finish. Finishing this race, y'all, is winning this race. The only way to lose is to quit. So don't quit. Don't leave. Don't turn away from all that you have been given. Don't walk away from all that you have been shown, all the benefits and blessings that God's covenant community share in together. Reassurance from God isn't just about observing fruit in other people's lives or, or in our own lives. It is that. It includes that. That should be there. That should encourage us where we find it. That's a good sign. But we have something so much more concrete than that. Something so much more immovable. That's what he says there in verses 13 through 20. In verse 20, he drops this Melchizedek name again. I know we're all eager to go there. We'll be there next week, okay? He drops this Melchizedek name in verse 20. He mentioned it back in verse 10, and he's going to come back to that. He's trying to get back there, but first he's taking this little detour here to issue this warning, to offer this encouragement and truth about God and his promises to his people. So essentially what he says here is, yes, things will get bumpy. Yes, you will have doubts. But 
you have a sure and steadfast anchor. That's how you hold on. That's how you combat those doubts. Because if we just base our hope on our, our experiences, what we observe in life, things can look a little dicey sometimes, can't they? It's hard to hold on to the hope he says we're supposed to have. It's hard to believe that. It's hard to run the race with endurance to the end. And here's what he says. He doesn't say uh, assurance comes by God removing the difficulty out of our lives. He says God gives us what we need to hold on, a sure and steady anchor. There's so much I could say right here about Abraham and how he struggled to believe the promises of God and, and how God reassured him. But if I go down that path, I'll say too much and then we might miss what I really want you to be able to get. So let me say this. You got some doubts? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll spare you the embarrassment. But answer that question for yourself right now. You got some doubts? Are you struggling to believe the promises of God that he has made to his people? You want assurance, the author says here. God knows you have doubts, and he doesn't want to leave you with them. He reassures you. And here's what he gives us to anchor us. God's oath. God's character. And God's own son. It's all riding on that. So how reliable is that? God swore by himself, it says there, because there was nothing higher for him to swear by. He swore by himself that Abraham's descendants would be more numerous than the stars, that they would be blessed and be a blessing. And you are one. God's oath he swore to Abraham is about you. Don't give me that, no, it's not, it's about Jesus thing. I know, of course it is. But it's about you too. God's oath to Abraham is about you. You are his descendants that God promised him, heirs of the promise that God made to Abraham. And God swore it would come true. How's that for assurance? Here you are. How about the character of God who makes the oath in the first place? Sure, he swore, but people go back on what they say all the time. People make promises and break them all the time. No, God is unchangeable. You need more convincing? He says here, he desired to show more convincingly the unchangeable character of his purpose, verse 17. And God doesn't lie, verse 18. He's not like man who breaks his promises. Because he is who he is, he cannot make a promise and not keep it. Do y'all see how amazing that is? Don't let it just kind of, you know, we talked about that last week, right? Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Don't hear without listening. Right? Do you know how amazing that is? Look at me. God did not have to prove himself to you, and he did it anyway. Amazing grace. He has a track record of faithfulness that he points us to, he has character witnesses. And he doesn't have to swear to us, but he does. And there's nothing higher for him to swear, and so he swears by himself. Sometimes we doubt God's promises because we can't imagine God could love us that much. We can't imagine that God actually loves us as much as he says he does. We know we don't deserve it, and rather than believing his promises, we go back to thinking we have to be worth it. And sometimes, some of us just don't feel worth it, do we? And so rather than believing on the promises of God, we're tempted to think, well, maybe he'll give up on me because he finds out I'm really not worth it after all. Christian, before the foundation of the world, God says he knew you. He 
He loved you before you could even know it. Before you could even feel loved. So if you don't feel loved today, it doesn't mean that you're not. His love never fails. But we want assurance. We want to know. We want to know for sure. You can know. You can know because of what you know he has given you. He's given you his oath. He's given you his word on this. He has given you his oath. He has given you evidence of his character and reason to believe that he can be trusted. And he's given you his son. So look, watch this. If you're going to know, you need to know him. You need to know the son that he has sent. If you're going to finish faithfully, if you're going to hang on tight to the end, you need to know Jesus. You need to know your anchor. If you want assurance that you are not that one who drifts away, if you want to know and have assurance that the promises of God are true, you're going to need to follow him. You have to know the one that you're following. And here's how the author finishes. He assures us we can know him. This is just good news after good news, and it? it just keeps getting better. It's like those old infomercials. But wait, there's more. It just keeps getting better. He says you can know. You have to know his son. And you can know him because Jesus himself entered into that inner place behind the curtain, that place that's too close to God for any man to enter, too intimate, too close, too private, too wonderful, too holy, too personal. He entered in so that we could enter in behind him. He is our forerunner on our behalf, verse 20, who secures our place, our standing, our relationship, and our access to the God who made us and redeems us. Amen. If you have doubts sometimes, Trouble believing the promises of God. He's not surprised by that. He's not angry at you for it. But he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants you to move out of that doubt into certainty because he wants you to know he can be trusted. And to know that is to know Jesus. Do you know him? Lots of people know of him, y'all. Doesn't count for anything. There'll be a long line of them one day. Do you know him? Not the guy who plays Jesus on TV. The Jesus who was crucified, died for sin, was buried, raised on the third day, ascended into heaven and reigns over heaven and earth now, making peace by the blood of his cross. Do you know, have you believed in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? A big part of being a believer in Christ. For those of you that know, that's true, and praise God. But a big part of being in that place, being in that believer, is believing these promises of God and being patient. That's what it takes to finish faithfully. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Believe in him. Wait patiently for the fulfillment of these promises. And Christian, you will finish faithfully. It's a promise from a God that does not break promises. Let's pray.